Hello, Buddhist Geeks. This is Vincent Horn, back again for another Buddhist Geeks interview, and I'm joined today by a very special guest, a friend, colleague, um, just a really special guy, Jay Michelson. Jay, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's about time too. Uh, <laughs> it's it's been it's been a long time coming, but um, really excited to chat with you today. And um, uh, maybe I'll say a little bit about your background for those who aren't familiar with your writing and your work yet. Um, Jay is a scholar of Jewish studies and also a practicing. Uh, what would you? How would you describe the practice that you do in Judaism? Is it non non dual Judaism? Judaism? Is it Kabbalah? Well, like how, how do how do you describe that part? Yeah, I put on my um, on my Facebook profile that I'm a non dual Buju Dharma fairy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that captures several things going on. Um, yeah. the, the the boo part is that you are a meditation teacher in the Mahasi Saida uh, noting tradition. Um, you're also a leader. Uh, I guess this is probably the fairy part of, of a, <laughs> your leader in the uh, LBGT community. Yeah. And um, uh, your last book was called uh, God versus Gay: uh, The Religious Case for Equality. Um, you have several other books before that, um, and then your latest one, which we wanted to kind of talk about some of the the themes and topics within, is uh, and I'll bring it up here to the uh, to the video camera, uh, is Evolving Dharma, Meditation, Buddhism, and the Next Generation of Enlightenment. So, yeah, really cool title. I'm excited to chat with you about it. And, you know, the first thing I noticed as I was uh, kind of reading through the book was um, that your past books, um, in terms of the themes that they explore and the topics, this seemed to be kind of like a little bit of a, of a topical departure. Um, and I was curious kind of where the idea arose um, to do a book uh, on the topic of uh, Dharma. Yeah, uh, that's a great kind of first question. Th of my five books, three of them have the word God in the title, so that that can definitely turn off a lot of potential readers. Um, you know, I think for me, this was really the book I wanted to write. Uh, the last one, God vs. Gay, was really a mainstream book, and it sold pretty well, and I did over 80 uh, speeches about it, you know, around the country, which is a crazy thing to do. And, you know, that's not my ambition for Evolving Dharma. I sometimes think that there's about 13 people in the world who will really like it, but they'll really like it. <laughs> and I think all 13 may be watching this uh, this um, broadcast right now. On exactly, exactly. So, you know, that was, it, it was, it's funny because as I've gone around to different environments who know me from my past work, this, you know, that my practice has really impacted everything, right? So it's impacted my activism. So I've told, like, the witty anecdotes, which are, you know, part and parcel of being on book tour, of uh, being confronted by outrageously homophobic people and using my meditation practice to respond in a way so I could actually win the debate rather than just, you know, be reactive. Or, uh, you know, on the religious side, you know, when I was doing a little bit more on the Jewish side than I am today, uh, you know, how meditation like, played into that and enabled the rituals to actually be felt more intensely and kind of audited the kind of theology to get rid of the stupid stuff. And it's funny because it's been in the background for all of these other books, but I, I really wanted it to be in the foreground um, of this one. Nice, nice. No, it's, a, uh, it's an exciting topic, and it is interesting from my point of view, you know, having started the podcast uh, seven years ago, um, that at the time, you know, no one was talking about the people that are in this book. Uh, really, most of the people you mention are people that came onto the scene, like people became aware of in the last several years. So it's pretty cool to see someone kind of studying and, and exploring and talking about and writing extensively about some of these new kind of people and communities and figures that are emerging in kind of uh, what you call next generation of enlightenment. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, part of my background actually that uh, they didn't mention is um, I have a PhD in religion, so like a, I'm a, like a professional scholar of religion supposedly, and uh, <laughs> it's it's better than you know some friends of mine went to divinity school and they got a master of divinity degree, which I think actually sounds way cooler. Um, so I, I wanted to get there first, actually. I, I admit one of my ambitions for the book was to kind of say that there's something new going on that it's been you know it's been on blogs and it's been in an article here and there obviously it's in Buddhist geeks you know I think you guys really know about some of this next generation stuff but it's not it's definitely not in the academic thinking of contemporary Buddhism and it's definitely not in the boomer communities either you know they're just not aware you know, like of what's going on and of, of what the changes are and that too you know it's just really exciting I mean I, I first met you know 
Kenneth Folk when he was like living in a garage over a garage at IMS, you know, and then living, yep. in, living in Beth's uh, parents' basement for a while. And it is really gratifying to kind of see, um, you know, see the, the flourishing of these kind of emerging Dharma communities. And it's fun now, you know, there's even like the reaction against and the backlash and, uh, you know, every day there's some other critical article either about neurodharma or, you know, this or that innovation, and that's clearly a sign of success. Huh. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I noticed the same thing, like, uh, it seems like in the beginning of a movement there's a lot of kind of uncritical, ex, uh, you know, excitement, and this is all great, and then following that comes a, a wave of criticism and kind of getting real, and hey, wait a second, are you guys considering this and this and this? Um, so it is cool to, to look at it from that perspective as being a, a kind of uh, success, as a kind of development or evolutionary Kind of sign, yeah. and you know, I think one of the things I, I wanted to do in the book too is that maybe it's a little more heretical for for Buddhist geeks, is to try to suggest that a lot of the evolutions in the contemporary Dharma can be seen in the same way, including Nick mindfulness and you know the really vulgarized, secularized BS kinds of mindfulness that we see a lot, including the kind of let's just say the excesses of some in the technology community uh, who are like super into supposedly superly into mindfulness. Um, and I, I actually, I, I don't want to be Pollyannish about it, but I actually do think that even these things are for the best. I think they're really good gateway drugs. And my hope is that, you know, 10% of the people who get into mindfulness actually take on serious practice. That could be really powerful. And, you know, I was sitting with um, Dan Goldman recently, an author of Emotional Intelligence, and his new book just became a New York Times bestseller, which Evolving Dharma probably will not. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, he said, you know, I, I, I talked to him about, you know, is there like a fork in the road between secular mindfulness and serious practice? And he really felt that there was. You know, he's like, look, this isn't Buddhism that's going on in the mainstream. It's something else. And he defended it because it's like it's still, it's still mitigating suffering. It's still lessening suffering, even if it's suffering of, of jerks, right, people who we want to have suffer. Am I allowed to say assholes on a, on a Buddhist Geeks podcast? Yeah, absolutely. You know, those, those are like the people whose suffering we're lessening, and we may not want to. But... I actually think that the forks do converge. I mean, I really do sort of believe that dedicated mindfulness practice will, you know, make mindfulness, like secularized mindfulness that's not, I don't mean secular Buddhism, I mean like pop mindfulness. Even that, I think, leads to certain kinds of openings and certain kinds of lifting of veils of ignorance that for some percentage of people, you know, might lead them to take practice more seriously. Right, right. I mean, you were mentioning in the book um, Willoughby Britton's research and the uh, varieties of contemplative experience and how many people she's finding in her research, um, they're meditating in the sort of pop mindfulness way, um, but then at a certain point, after doing it for a while, suddenly things shift or can shift, and then suddenly they find themselves kind of looking for different kinds of material that I guess we would consider more hardcore, uh, kind of more uh, kind of deeper contemplative type materials. Yeah, and as you know, I mean, Willoughby uh, sees it from the dark side, right? And her, in her sure. theory, like, people are doing um, MBSR, and then all of a sudden, like, the shit hits the fan. You know, they have some powerful experience that they understand is really negative, and on its, you know, on its surface, it's really difficult. And they they have no orientation to the developmental maps that are out there, and no sense of like, wow, this is actually part of the practice, and not you're cracking up. I mean, I think for me, I'm actually still skeptical of that data. I have, I'm still waiting for that. Like, really, people just doing MBSR and through the dark night. Um, but definitely, I, I know firsthand, you know, a lot of stories of people who do that kind of practice. And then, you know, they want to take it to the next level. And they might not go off and, and do a Mahasi retreat for, for six weeks or three months. But they, but they might actually show up at their local Zen center and just see what it's about. Yeah, yeah. No, it, uh, just just to reference back, we we did a, a Geeks of the Roundtable dialogue with Willoughby and Daniel Ingram recently, and they they got into just this question of how easy or hard is it to to get into what they're calling the dark night stages. So, um, so if people are interested in that, at, le at least there's some conversation happening around it. Um, you know, the other thing I wanted to bring up um, is that in the book, uh, one of the in kind of most interesting areas that you explore, kind of from my point of view, is um, this notion that there are these new kinds of Buddhist communities emerging. And clearly, you know, Buddhist geeks uh, maybe is part of that. Um, what we're doing with uh, kind of virtual cloud-based sanghas, as we, as we call it, is I think part of that experimentation. Um, but I was curious, as you were starting to research a kind of a broader landscape of communities, um, what were the kinds of characteristics that you were noticing 
of these new kind of Buddhist communities, and in particular, um, how are they connected to and perhaps different from what's come before in terms of uh, the more bo uh, boomer Buddhist institutions? So I, I think there's maybe two key pieces that I found in common looking looking at Buddhist geeks and looking at Dharma Overground and looking at intentional communities and social justice focused communities and like a lot of the different kinds of models that are there. Um, and the two have to do with uh, a circle and the sensibility. Uh, the first, uh, the circularity rather than the linearity, almost all of the emerging communities that I've come across that are really vibrant diverge from the sort of standard hierarchical model where there's the teacher up here with the information and the passive uh, students who are receiving it, right? And it's that that very old school hierarchical download of information. And interestingly, you know, I was just uh, I had I had a coffee this morning uh, with the executive director of New York Insight, which is not an emerging community in the traditional sense, right? It's, it's part of uh, the sort of insight meditation society universe, and she actually felt the same way. I mean, I think this is trickling into the mainstream very quickly. Uh, that this idea that you know the generation of uh, of, I, of the iPod and of Spotify uh, and of Occupy and of food courts rather than restaurants are going to want some expert to curate their experience that just doesn't fit with how people are living their lives in any way right it doesn't fit with like Facebook and Twitter let alone you know with the serious ways in which we configure our political lives so that lack of that move away from hierarchicalization was one. And then I think one of the things that you and I have talked about is, well, how do you, you know, how do you deal with expertise, you know, right. different levels of expertise within, a, with, you know, outside of that traditional hierarchy? Because obviously, you know, there's a benefit to having experts inform beginners, but can we do it without the power games and all that stuff? And the second piece, I'll, it'll be shorter, is just I think that sensibility, the touchy-feely, love, light, uh, dew drops on a on a leaf, sensibility, um, that just is less resonant for folks who are not of that generation. I, I don't, you know, I still do find younger people who are into meditation because it makes them feel sweetness and light, and that's, they want to have those mind states, and so, great, you know, that's fine. But more and more, it's, it, there's less patience for the cheese. And I certainly look forward to that, you know, where there's just not a, a single cultural trapping that envelops all of the dharma. And but you you know I think that change is is slow in coming. Um, it's even interesting, like at Wisdom 2.0, for example, which styles itself as like you know next generation and stuff. You know the teachers who really bring home the bacon in terms of like who are the big draws do sometimes have that more traditional uh, sensibility around them. Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. A couple things there I wanted to go into with you. Um, uh, so going back to your first point about. Um, the generation, I think you call it a uh, generation that's practicing I spirituality. You know, uh, this group of people who are curating, in some sense, their own uh, streams of media, their own kind of, uh, they're, they're kind of choosing who to pay attention to and in what way. A and then there's this piece of the uh, kind of expertise or hierarchy or kind of, uh, you know, higher and lower in terms of knowledge. So, I was just thinking, you know, the, the examples that you gave, Facebook, Spotify, Twitter, things like this, um, is so interesting because even on those platforms, you have uh, obviously people who are paid a lot more attention to, um, you know, the millions of followers, people with millions of followers on Twitter or, uh, or Facebook. So, so clearly there's already built into those systems, there is a, a kind of hierarchy of attention. And um, and yet it, it's it's different. It's not structured in the same way in terms of I go to Facebook and Facebook tells me who I should pay attention to and what you know what what I should understand. So um, it, I just wanted to kind of explore that with you because it is interesting that you do see kind of hierarchy within this much more decentralized, uh, self curated systems. Well, and I think that's you know probably the clumsiest rollout of Facebook's many clumsy rollouts. Uh, was the attempt to kind of curate your, you know, your main, the river there, the mainstream. Mm. And, you know, based on the people they thought that you'd find interesting. And at least in my friend cohort, you know, most of us thought they got it wrong, right? I mean, they weren't actually, they may have been picking people who they thought we had the most in common with or something. But I think, for hopefully, you know, the next generation, both of that particular product, but then maybe of other ones that come to replace it, will give a little more agency so that I can curate it you know, and a little bit, and see who else is curating what, and, and it'll feel a little bit more like, actually, like the way that Spotify does it, a little less like the way, you know, someone tries to tell you who they, who they think is important to you. But I think that's right, and it, it should be natural, and it should be social, 
that, uh, you know, the, I don't want to say the cream rises to the top or something, but just people who have expertise in a certain area. You know, I think one of my interviews in the book, um, you know, there's a lot of interviews with some of the people who you've interviewed, uh, Daniel and Kenneth and others, and, you know, Kenneth said, yeah, of course I set myself out as someone who knows something about this subject, but that's very different from a guru. And mm. I think that's right. I, you know, I, I just find the whole guru thing, I've noticed over the last few years of my life that I have a higher anti-authority threshold than most people. Like, I just really don't like to be told what to do and to sit in rows. I'm probably more than most. But even so, I think a lot of, certainly a lot of creative people, you know, don't want to sacrifice their autonomy to some guru. And I have met guru followers, and they're super into it, and they love it, and they trust everything, they trust their guru. And that's fine if that model really works. I just think it's it's also incredibly susceptible to abuse. And and for me, I, I think it's kind of gross. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not the way I live any part of my life. Like, the films I see, or, you know, the spirituality that I practice, or the Buddhism that I do, or, like, there's no part of my life that is organized that way. Yeah, I mean, and I think just looking around, it's pretty easy to recognize that that traditional model in a modern context just time and again fails dramatically. I mean, I've just recently, in the last few months, had a couple friends who are part of a guru uh, community, and the whole thing just got torn asunder, and it was uh, ridiculously painful and confusing um, for everyone that was involved, and obviously an example of how it doesn't work to have that kind of absolutistic, you know, top-down um, pyramid model uh, transposed into, you know, a context where, you know, really for the past few hundred years we've been breaking that kind of thing down culturally. Yeah, and I think there's this weird. I think I think it's bound up with this kind of weird orientalization as and exoticism of like the Indian teacher or the Tibetan guru or something like that. You know, these are cultures, Indian, Tibet, and Japan in particular, Burma, also Thailand you know, that have a monastic tradition that's developed organically over hundreds, even thousands of years. And to just import that into the West, we've seen what happens. And I think part of the reason why it is attractive is this kind of dark, you know, Yodaization of the meditation teacher. Like, <laughs> I, want, I want the Asian teacher with the funny accent who I have to do these exotic things to, and I have to, you know, because I want this kind of exotic adventure. Um, and I, I think that's a, a really immature place to be. And I, I just uh, maybe I should say, obviously, I don't want to stereotype students of teachers, or obviously not Asian teachers, or not all. But I think there is this pattern of I want the teacher to be, you know, this Yoda figure, so that I can sacrifice my own responsibility for my own practice. Whereas when you go back to the original teachings, obviously, yeah, you have a teacher. But I mean, the Buddha over and over again, you know, find out for yourself, try this for yourself, see how this works transposing the traditions into different cultural contexts, not insisting on a particular form over and over again. So there's at least precedent for a less hierarchical model. And I think, you know, last piece on this, you know, this might be a matter of taste or something for some people, but uh, Rita Gross, the kind of Buddhist feminist, has written really well, I think, and persuasively to me, on the, the problematic gender issues with Buddhist patriarchy. Mm. And so even if even if we think it's just a matter of taste, it is also a matter of justice when a lot of people, and they tend to be male people, and they tend to be, you know, in certain various forms of privilege, and they tend not to, not to be fully representative uh, kind of in terms of diversity, racial, ethnic diversity. When some people have that level of power, there's also a justice concern in addition to the kind of, you know, sketchiness of it. Mm, okay, great. Um, kind of, I guess, building off of what we've already been talking about here, one of the things I was struck um, by as I read the book was also that the way you were sort of characterizing Buddhism as it's evolving is, is as a kind of radical self-questioning that, that the tradition seems to be going through and the people within this so-called tradition. Um, questioning of myths, uh, of past dogmas, of the supremacy of certain models, or the universality of them, you know, the universal dharma that applies to all people. Um, what do you make of this questioning process that you seem to be describing? Um, does this seem like, uh, overall, a, a fairly positive move, or are there some things about this questioning that could potentially uh, lead to some um, potentially destructive and, and maybe uh, in some sense, I, I want to say like a loss uh, or an overreaction to s some things. Um, just curious kind of how you're seeing that process of questioning. 
Yeah, it's definitely both and. Yeah, mm. there's definitely the you know the the perspective, the possibility of new ideas and you know more ferment and more skepticism and more self reflection, and of watering it down and of missing something. You know, the biggest example of that probably was that the very wise and I, I say this sincerely, I think it was a very wise idea of some of the first Western importers of Buddhism to kind of just focus on uh, the cultivation of mindfulness and meditation and not focus on Buddhist ideas about virtue and, and the ethics and so on and so forth. But when you strip out this one piece from the whole, from Sila Samadhi Panya in the, in the Theravadan context, um, ethics, uh, concentration, and wisdom, when you just strip out one piece, you know, you are left with, with an incomplete vehicle. I mean, it doesn't work. It just doesn't run. And uh, it leads to all kinds of bad results. And that's just one example where it can lead to the dark side. But I think, you know, I don't think this is a Buddhist phenomenon. I, you know, I, I have studied other religions in my professional work. And, you know, there's this tension always between the kind of world-maintaining, institutionalized religion piece and the world-destroying, non-institutional kind of spirituality or mystical piece. And I, not, I don't want to use the word mysticism to describe kind of what we're talking about in meditation, but it, it's that impulse, which it tends to be more um, driven by autonomy and by your experience and sort of disregard some of the structures that may be in place. It's certainly unmediated. It's not meant to be something that, you know, the priest or rabbi or monk or roshi, you know, hands down to you, right? It's your, it's your practice that you're doing. And those tendencies, they exist in Judaism and Christianity and Islam, also in, in Hinduism and obviously in Buddhism as well. And they've always been that dialectic. You know, the first couple of hundred years of Zen in Japan was radically, you know, uh, anti-authority and questioning and tearing down destructive conventions. And then it became a state religion. And its job became to maintain conventions and the power structure and the financial stability of the Zen temples. And, the, you know, and, and they got involved in imperial politics and in war. And this just seems to happen all the time, and, and it seems to be how organizations and ideologies happen. And it's not just religious, right? It's also true for political ideologies, right? So the uh, Occupy starts out one way and turns into something else. Or the, you know, the Tea Party starts out as some you know radical band of crazy lunatics and then takes over the Republican Party from the you know uh, from within. So it's not it's not uh, it's it's this phenomenon between like I was, I was calling it world maintaining and world destroying, and it's that dialectic that I think we're living in. Yes, and you know, so one thing that's very interesting to me about the dialectic, you know, between uh, what you're calling world maintaining and world destroying, or you know, Jack Cornfield talks about you know conserving and adapting. Uh, I think it's pretty similar. Um, you know, it's not just that that dialectic has always been kind of happening, which I mean, clearly it has been happening, but it's also that it's happening in a new kind of context that we don't have really much reference points for, you know, where things seem to be changing not over generations but over years. Uh, so yeah, that, I mean, that's fascinating. That's absolutely the case. You know, the pace of change is just radically increased. I mean, it is. This is kind of a banal point now, but it wasn't banal what 15 years ago. You know, in the sort of early middle days or of the internet. You know the fact that literally at the at, you know one click away from esoteric wisdom that used to be completely unavailable to all but the elites of whatever tradition you know and that's true for the secret tantric teachings or the secret kabbalistic teachings or whatever not you know and and it's now that those barriers are down and so these secret esoteric traditions have had to really work with that and that's true in the dharma as well I mean I think you know just bringing it back. To home, you know, you and I have talked a lot about some of the developmental models in meditation practice, and maybe they're useful, and maybe they're not, and so on. You know, those just as recently as the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, and still now, if you go to the mainstream Western Theravadan Dharma centers, those maps are secret. <laughs> you know, like they're not discussed, and so you can't really have the conversation of is this a good map or not because you don't know that it even exists, let alone the details. You know, now. If you choose to, if somebody tells you about it, you Google it, and you can come up with any number of articles or podcasts, Buddhist Geeks podcasts, talking about this exact subject. And that, to me, yeah, that is new, right? The availability of all of that information and rapidly increasing the, the, the feedback loops for how it gets processed and, and, and fixed in. Yeah, interesting. Um, t toward the end of the book, you, you know, uh, make some predictions about the future. You also... Uh, um, kind of acknowledge going in how difficult it is to predict the future, especially given what we just said um, about the nature of change and how change itself is changing really rap rapidly. Um, that said, I thought you touched on some interesting um, 
some interesting themes there. Themes, you know, connected to, for instance, uh, neurodharma, kind of how the contemplative neuroscience field is changing and evolving, and also the ways in which that might uh, eventually translate into particular technologies. You know, something we explore uh, extensively in the, you know, contemplative technology show. Um, I'm curious, yeah, as you look at the future, you know, which is hard to do. Um, what are the things that you're struck by the most um, as you look at Dharma and the way it's changing? So I think the one prediction I feel comfortable in making is that we ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, <laughs> I think we really are at a, like a point of inflection in the Western Dharma. And um, it was funny, I asked uh, Richie Davidson, you know, the noted neurodharmist, <laughs> uh, or neurodharmogian, if uh, what he thought, you know, what's like the most important next thing that's going to happen. And he said this a few times. He said, uh, it's not actually my data, the scientific data. Now it's going to be the econometric data. Mm. You know, once we can really establish and quantify the decrease in healthcare utilization, for example, uh, that, that uh, mindfulness interventions bring about, it'll become pretty quickly clear. I mean, we all know this, right, but it's just not been established. It'll become pretty quickly clear that this is like the cheapest intervention you could imagine that could save billions of dollars per year across the U.S. healthcare system. And that's, you know, it's going to explode. Right? I mean, that's going to be something that's utilized by capitalism is what's going to spread the dharma, right? And the insurance companies and schools and, you know, the military and all of those places. And we may, that may make us feel a little uneasy, right, in the more dedicated practitioner community. But I think it is going to happen. And like I said before, hopefully it will be a gateway drug to really deeper practice. Um, that I feel really comfortable about predicting because uh, it's already happening. You know, I think where it gets really fancy and, and uncertain is in the more... The, the cooler, farther reaches of science fiction, neurodharma. And I don't know if you've had folks like that on, on, on these broadcasts, but it, there are fun conversations, and Daniel loves going into them. You know, like, so you're, you're going to have this drug, and it's going to be able to perfectly simulate the fourth jhana, and you're going to take it, and it's going to last 15 minutes, and you're going to... And maybe that's true. You know, I mean, it would be interesting if, if we're just at this intermediate stage where we're, like, clunking around with these old technologies but, you know, you'll, you'll have an embeddable, wearable system attached to the back of your neck or something that, you know, that in, improves your prefrontal cortex performance relative to the amygdala, and, you know, boom, you may as well, you don't need to sit every morning. Um, that's all science fiction, but it's not too remote from where, you know, some of the experimental uh, neuroscience is now, and God only knows, right? I mean, it, it starts to sound like Brave New World and, and uh, dystopian fantasies uh, when we really think about the possibilities of that. But... I think for me, one reason that I, I, I don't make that prediction is uh, futurism, I find, is always kind of wrong, you know, transhumanism and extropianism and so on, and they're, they're totally fun, but I need, a few more, I need a few more drinks of whiskey before I can take it seriously. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe uh, on our next Buddhist Geeks interview, we'll, uh, we'll make some time beforehand to uh, <laughs> take well, that we can, whiskey. We can play <laughs> A Buddhist Geeks drinking game where, you know, we and then everybody watching, you know, every time someone says neurodharma, you have to take another shot, you know, <laughs> or like... Or enlightenment, or, or jhana. Yeah, yeah, exactly, whatever the stage is, you know, and if you Sudhi Maga, you have to, like, chug an entire beer, basically, and somebody says that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I can see a, a future uh, show format developing right here. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, let me let me just uh, end here and and sort of open it up for questions because I think um, you know for those that are tuning in live, you know, there's some interesting stuff uh, that we brought up here. Obviously, we've compressed a ton of information into a short 30-minute soundbite. So if there were things that you heard while you're listening live that you want to kind of ask about, uh, questions that you have. Um, we've got a little bit more time with Jay, and he's uh, graciously offered to answer some questions with the community members. So, um, yeah, feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A app in Google, and um, feel free to vote uh, up other people's questions. Um, this is the sort of self-organizing, peer-to-peer community experiment <laughs> um, that we're conducting here. So. Let's do it. But thank God. I mean, how many times have we like sat in on like Dharma talks, and there's some fantastic teacher there, not present company excluded, right? There's some incredible teacher, and then someone asks this like brain dead, boneheaded question, and we all have to sit there, and everybody's rolling their eyes. Like we need to have this in Dharma halls where people can vote up or down questions before they're articulated. That would be like that would be awesome. Yeah. No. Um. I hate to say it, but yeah, I totally know what you mean. It seems like. Um, in some sense, the people with the most interesting questions uh, just know that they can't ask them in those contexts. 
so it's like the in some sense the the kind of yes yeah, some well, of the they're being reflective, up. right? If you want to ask a reflective question, you have to reflect, which means you're not first in line to ask your question. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. So um, we do have one question here from Nicole. Um, I'll just bring it up uh, and see what you think. Uh, she said, while there are certainly issues with patriarchy and culture that practice Buddhism, do you attribute this to the practice, uh, to the practice as I heard, or more to the culture where it is practiced? Do you see that as an issue for Western monastics? I think that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, first, I'll just give a shout out again to Rita Gross, uh, who's written a book on the subject and several articles, and I think is really articulate about it and kind of talking in detail. There's also an anthology that she edited uh, that has a lot of different perspectives uh, from women on that on that question, that exact question. You know, I think um, I, I don't think it's in the practice of watching the breath or the practice of uh, chanting or the practice of whatever. I don't I don't think it's that uh, that leads to the patriarchy and to the abuse. Um, but I think it's a little deeper than just, well, these are patriarchal cultures. Um, because I think we're implicated as well. Uh, whether we import them the way that I was talking about before, or we replicate them and, or, and put them into Western patriarchal cultures, um, I think it's pretty hard to get away from patriarchy. And, you know, I, I think it can be an aid to Dharma practice to just become more aware of these vectors of oppression and subjugation that are constantly in the mix. Um, you know, you're just aware of, well, there's this thought, but this, this is, I'm not this thought, this is part of this system of patriarchy, and here it is, and, you know, being aware of that and seeing it in our teachers and calling them on their, on their shit, uh, where, where they're manifesting it. Um, you know, I think for monastics in particular in the West, I think that is really a question. Um, you know, it depends a little on your methodology, you know, so some people have the methodology of studying Buddhism. But, you know, you pick out the parts that, that serve you, right? And so we focus on the egalitarian aspects of the Buddhist teachings, and we ignore all of those, like, hundreds of years of misogynistic uh, teachings that were, that were promulgated in his name. And as a practitioner, that may be more useful, right, because you're taking the good and leaving aside the bad. You know, as a historian of religion or a scholar of religion, we have to just sort of face up that it's there. This material is part of the tradition. And, um, you know, we're also not escaping our prejudices either. And um, I think it's a good act of kind of humility to recognize the imperfection of all of these traditions, which of course is heresy, right? Because the Dharma is supposed to be totally perfect. But I think recognizing every the imperfection and the historical contingency of it is is actually part of the practice. Well, and you know, to to think that every, that something should be perfect is itself a definition of an ideology. You know, that's you know how utopian and dystopian ideologies emerge. That this idea of what perfection is somehow that, that it's reachable. Yeah, no, that's definitely that's definitely right. And yeah, there's that great Onion article from like ten years ago about the utopian community of peace and love that uh, ends up killing each other over a blanket, basically. Mm. And uh, that does happen, you know, when we have these high ideals uh, of, of what the teacher should be or what the community should be. I think it's good to just, um, I mean, the metaphor that's coming up is like, just get naked on the first day of the retreat and just be like, All right, this is not, you know, there's not going to be this, uh, this perfect, you know, perfect body and this perfect lover and this perfect teacher and this perfect sangha. There'll be a sangha of, of flawed people doing good work and trying to do the or not, but hopefully trying to do the good work. And and that um, that more modest ambition, I think, is is important. You know, you and I talked about this at one point in the past about what's the kind of the Buddhist peaks um, uh, view on on this question, I, and that's not specifically around gender, but about life and practice. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to bring our practice into our lives, but we should also bring our lives into our practice. And to me, that includes like our political commitments, not as blocks, not like I'm holding on to this, and if this male teacher from Burma tells me I have to bow down to him, I'm just going to get really tight and not going to do it. Like, maybe I will do it, but I'll do it because I'm participating in a forum, I'm aware of it, I'm understanding that this particular forum is not going to accommodate every political idea that I have, but I'm not denying the importance of that either. And we're, yes. we're making it better, right? I mean, we, there's this... Again, this kind of um, I think it's a I think it's a kind of Orientalism. Like, no, no, no. There's the authentic Buddhism in Tibet or something, and we're just doing this pale imitation. That's false, demonstrably, and it's also and it's it's uh, it's colonialist, and it gets in the way of practice. Right? We are actually we can we are making the, the sangha better and worse at the same time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we are changing this thing for better and for worse, and that's what the evolving dharma is about. 
Mm. Yeah, well put. Um, another question here that got voted up. Um, this is from Daniel Thorson, who's our community director. Um, I'm maybe using his community ties to uh, get his question voted up. I don't know. Um, <laughs> how can we make <laughs> style politics here? <laughs> He says, uh, how can we make deeper teachings more accessible? How do we make sure that folks encountering mindfulness have the opportunity to go deep if they so choose? Yeah, I think that's a, another great question. I'm glad these, <laughs> the voting up thing is working, at least from my perspective. Um, you know, I think part of it is that we, we don't, there's a, there's a really great teaching. I think it's, it's either Ramana Maharshi or Nisargadatta. It's one of the, the Vedanta non-dual sages. And I'll try to get this right. Uh, he's, or actually, way way way, I think said it. That the 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 truthfulness of the teaching that a, a skilled teacher does increases as time goes up. Meaning, it starts out being really untruthful, and then becomes more and more truthful as the student gets wiser. I totally mangled that quote, but that's that that was the sentiment. And you know, I think that might be true here as well. That I think we we want to meet people where they are. And I actually think McMindfulness is doing Buddha Speaks in communities like this a huge favor. Right, because it's making this accessible to a large number of people, and more experienced communities or more hardcore communities, let's say, can just say, "Hey, you know, what? we're not, we're not like dumbing, we're not dumbing this down, we're not an introductory thing. Like, this is like a little more hardcore. And if it's too much, here's like a wave of other things that you could look into. And then, you know, not everybody wants to go hardcore about everything. Like, maybe you want to try French cooking, but you don't want to do the the recipe that takes three hours to prepare." You know, so having that diversity out there, and I think I think what's in that question is the reverse, right? So how do we tell the people who have just I don't know tasted a, a croissant that there's a whole wave of, of French cuisine out there that they might find interesting? And I think it is about um, you know sometimes it's about just getting in front of the mainstream audiences, you know, and old-fashioned stuff like Google Ads and things like that, and just like letting people know that this stuff exists. You know, part of it is is really asking folks to network back in their own community. So if there's somebody who's in an MBSR circle and then they try out something a little more hardcore, like say, hey, you know, let folks know about this and, you know, here's how this thing can become another spore of another of a community that's growing organically. And I think that that kind of reverse networking down. But I, I don't think I don't think it's about I think it's about differentiation, not homogenization. I don't think that communities that are focused on more hardcore practice should also have the like mindfulness or accessibility wing to them in order to appeal to a broad scope. I don't think I think that just dilutes what's valuable. Instead, it's to kind of say, and you know, the, the real model for this to kind of say, this is what we do, and here's here's what's on offer, and there are these other things too. And um, Adyashanti, the spiritual teacher Adyashanti, has done a, a a pretty good job at doing that. You know, he's one person, and it is a guru, sort of a guru model, not quite, but kind of, and so it's a different kind of form. But he says he's like, you know. Do your basic practice, you know, and come to me when you're burned out of it. <laughs> and that's an interesting thing. And the way he teaches, it's funny because he's so charismatic and good looking and sweet that a lot of first kind of first timers do come and they're they're swept up in the in the loving feeling. But his practice is actually, you know, pretty fierce, you know, like really cuts through some of the stuff that's there. And um, and it really, yeah, I found it a, a benefit, you know, in a sort of stage of my practice, having, you know, been doing my thing for a few years, to go to someone who just radically questioned all of those assumptions was really helpful. So I, I think it's it's about differentiation and just being being out there in the landscape. Yeah, no, really well put, and I'd, I'd have to just second that. Um, everything you're saying makes a lot of sense. And I love that Google AdWords uh, was included in your old school recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Okay, another question that uh, came to the top here from Martin Dive. Um, I haven't managed to think of an area in which capitalism has not corrupted what is touched. How do you see Dharma practice surviving this touch? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, three for three, and I think in terms of questions. So I think the key word there is corrupting. You know, and what we mean by that. Right. Um, you know, it's it's just. One person's corruption is another person's mainstreaming and popularization and spreading, you know, spreading the good news or something. And I, you know, I use the word vulgarization rather than corruption when I talk about it in the book. And and I see it for what it is, right? It is a vulgarization. It's and it is a dilution. And yet, that also makes it more accessible to more and more people. 
Um, you know, this is still an experiment. The idea that monastic practice could be could be taken on by the masses of people is a is a you know made by 125 years old monastic Buddhist practice. Really, that we could and you know think about when reading the Bible in uh, medieval Christian Europe, you know, giving into the giving way to the Renaissance became widespread. It takes a while for that to really filter in that you know ordinary people can actually have access to these teachings, whether it's the Bible or meditation or whatever. And and so yeah, I think there is just as I mean I'll say with Christianity, you know, capitalism has certainly corrupted the the hell out of Christianity. Um, you know, the prosperity gospel and the idea that Jesus, who said that it's easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to go to heaven, somehow wants you to be rich and not help the poor and not help the weak. <laughs> you know, it is shocking and at, at, at how that message has been changed. But it also, I, I do think it, it leads, it can be a gateway drug, like I said before. It can be the entry point for a more serious engagement with practice, whether that practice is, you know, Christianity or, or, or uh, Dharma or whatever. Um, and I, I think, I hope that that's true here as well. Um, maybe not. You know, it may well be that this thing just gets totally, uh, you know, sanitized in a way that it just props up the very lifestyles uh, that it's me that it's meant to question. But yeah, then we do go back to what Dan Goldman said. I mean, if it really is lessening suffering, you know, I, I've sometimes thought that, like, in my own practice for me, like, if the only thing that it accomplishes is making one less asshole on the planet. That's not. That's pretty good, right? Like if we just have one fewer asshole, you know, for every person who was who was doing a little bit of practice, um, that would be great. And and I feel like there's a decent percentage of capitalist pop meditation practitioners uh, who will be slightly less of an asshole uh, than they were before. And that feels like that, I mean that's a huge change, right? Mm. High bar you're setting there. One less asshole in the world. <laughs> well, that's my own practice ambition. Like, you know, forget, like, that, well, that's a, that's a huge that's goal right. then. In that case, <laughs> <laughs> <a> high standard. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. That's that's a great response. Um, and thanks, Martin, for the question. Um, okay, th uh, this question sort of catapulted to the top. I noticed uh, from Ed Kako. Um, There's an emerging sense from psychologists and philosophers. Uh, that a robust morality needs to be grounded in metacognition. Uh, Robert Wright and others have identified Buddhism as key to solving global problems. What do you think the prospects of this are? Yeah, except for the last sentence about Buddhism being key, I think, I, yeah, I think that's great. And, um, you know, I think metacognition is where it's at, right? And being aware of one's, of one's own thoughts and thought processes and that self-reflectivity. It is, um, I, and again, I'll come back to the, the capitalization of, of capitalismization of dharma and mindfulness. You know, if we could just get folks getting a little bit of metacognition in their basic education, that uh, that would be huge, right? And that's definitely not where large swaths of the American public are. You know, in terms of just being able to see your own thoughts and to reflect on your own thoughts and like think about thinking and like just the very basic stuff, which you do if you you know you do one one lousy 45 minute or 15-minute meditation set, you've hopefully gotten a little bit about what that's about. Like, oh, look, a thought just arose. I don't have to believe that thought. And that in itself, I mean, honestly, I've had it, I'll just do an analogy, you know, from my last book when I was doing, like, touring around on LGBT issues. You know, we shouldn't minimize the extent to which gay people disgust some straight people, right? Mm -hmm. It's, like, just disgusting. And I had it in my face, right? I mean, people were just viscerally disgusted. I would go to, like, you know, fundamentalist environments, things like that. And, you know, just the, that little piece of being able to say, all right, I, this, I have this, I'm having this reaction, being aware that it's even there, because often it just manifests as moral disgust, mm -hmm. and it's not even clear what's really going on. All right, so I'm having this reaction. Why am I having this reaction? Where is this coming from? Is this true? You know, rather than just immediately believing the thoughts, you know, getting, and I've done that practice, I don't want to say practice, like I've had that conversation in more secular religious language, actually, not Buddhist language or philosophical language, with people. It's like, well, you know, is that is that true because it feels true? Like, is that, you know, just very basically. And so I, I agree. I mean, whether, I'm not sure that, you know, is it Buddhism that, that has to be responsible for that? I'm not sure. I mean, I also think just basic good moral critical reasoning could do some of it. Uh, for me, obviously, the, the Buddhist technologies are the ones that have worked um, and just stop believing my thoughts. And back on, you know, on the gay issue again, I've had those thoughts myself, right? You don't you don't grow up gay in the 1980s and 90s in America without having a lot of self disgust and self hatred, mm -hmm. and like and a thought will come up that's from those you know from that period, 
and I can just see it. I just see it really clearly. It's like, okay, there's that, you know, there's that script. Mm. You know, I've I've seen that script for a long time, so I don't believe it at all at this point. And it doesn't actually come up as much as it used to, but like it comes up, and it's like, oh, all right, there it is, gay shame. Yeah, don't need to handle that. Do I believe that? Do I think that? Is that really right? And then being able to have some some frame around that, I think, is just is crucial. Yeah, no, I, I I like how you're describing this because in some sense you're acknowledging there are these cultural scripts which are operating within us and that we can't simply, uh, by bringing awareness to once, it doesn't just dissolve those things. It, these are very powerful, uh, use the term memes, you know, these are powerful memes that exist within us. At the same time that you're kind of acknowledging the capacity to be aware of something does seem to have an effect even if it's over the long term. Um, yeah, I, I think it does. I mean, if you just own your privilege, right? I mean, I grew up in the South in the 80s, right? So I, I grew up racist, right? And just casual racism. Like, it wasn't, like, the acute racism maybe we would see and condemn, but, like, the everyday racism about, you know, the kids of color in my school and what I thought about them and stuff. And, you know, you, you don't necessarily get over that. You don't just, the thoughts don't just stop arising. You're just like, oh, well, there it is. You know, there's my white privilege. There's my male privilege. You know, there's this and that. And, and there's that blindness. And, you know, we choose which thoughts to honor and which thoughts to turn into action. Mm. And I actually got in trouble. So in one of my other careers, I, I talk about Israel-Palestine a lot and try to get more dialogue going on. And I said, like, don't you understand? Like, of course, if you're getting bombs from from Gaza into your town all the time, you're going to want to kill the Palestinians. And if you're getting occupied by Israeli arm, the Israeli army all the time, you're going through checkpoints, you want to kill Israelis. Like, this is what this is natural, right? You will feel these things. The question is, which of our thoughts and instincts do we actually dignify and act on? And just because, you know, like John Kerry said to George Bush, you can be certain and be wrong. If something love party, uh, it doesn't. Any like a reaction. And yeah, whether the same world or just metacognition in one form or fashion. There has to be that, and I, I work with, I know reactive people all the time, uh, where it's just, you know, trigger response, and not like, well, what's, do we want to look at that response? Can we be aware of the response before it happens, you know, is, and sometimes the frame is so invisible, you know, we don't even see, we don't see our racism, we don't see our sexism, and, and so there's that, those, that two-piece thing of looking at it, raising awareness in the political sense, and raising awareness in the sense of metacognition. And uh, the, I think those are two great tastes that taste great together. Hmm. Mm. Okay, cool. Um, maybe one last question um, with the time we have. Um, and there are lots more that, that we're not going to be able to respond to, and, and many of them are really great. Um, so uh, this is uh, a question from uh, John uh, Blois. And um, he says, moving away from the guru framework, how do you vi envision an effective strategy for picking a teacher or qualifying yourself. Many of today's mainstream teachers like Pema Chodron, Sharon Salzberg, Jack Kornfield, etc., emphasize their guru connections. Yeah, no, I think that's true for some more than others. I think Pema, who I love, I think does that a little more than Jack and Sharon. But that's that's true. There is this sense of like authenticity, you know, this this myth that uh, well I'm in the I'm in the lineage, I'm in the chain and so that makes it more authentic. Um, Whereas, you know, there are plenty of uh, monastic teachers. You have another book, an e-book, actually, just came out about a secular community here in New York, uh, where I am. Uh, it's actually called The Zen Predator of the Upper East Side uh, by a friend of mine, Mark Oppenheimer. You know, there are plenty of people right within the tradition who are still huge uh, fuck-ups, basically. So, and yet, we still persist in this idea. You know, I think it, I, I think the, the way of uh, finding a teacher is, is crowdsourcing that teacher and, you know, where people, I mean, when I was looking for teachers, you know, my first few, um, it was kind of hard to get a sense of, you know, what people thought. You know, what if we had, like, a Buddhist version of those, um, I forget what those websites are called, where, like, the class notes, you know, for your college professor, like, well, this guy's really smart, but his lectures are, are boring, or this guy's a tough grader, you know, whatever. Yep. You know, I think if we had something like that for Dharma teachers, that could be really helpful, and it could be it could be really nice to crowdsource. You know, it could be like uh, Buddhist Yelp, Belt. You know, <laughs> you can just tell about your teachers, and um, you know, I think that's I think that's that's one way, and, and having the community kind of you know really chime in in meaningful ways, and you can tell when someone's praising a teacher for something that you're not interested in, 
you know, if you're a, a left-brained kind of person and hear someone saying this teacher is so sensitive and open-hearted, that might be praised. You might you could then see that maybe this isn't the right teacher for you if you want someone a little more, you know, and vice versa, obviously. Um, so I think that's, and, you know, in terms of self-authentication, I think that's an interesting, that's a question that we haven't yet really dealt with. Um, I do think, you know, and I think I think actually here some of the Western institutions, Spare Rock and IMS, um, and the and the Theravadan side, and uh, some of the more Westernized Zen centers are are doing pretty good work because to be a good teacher is much more than just knowing the Dharma, right? People go to their teachers with they go to them like clergy members, you know, and like they they unload all of their stuff, and it takes you know you have to really have a a, a pastoral sensibility to do that kind of work. And that takes training. That's not even Dharma training. That's something else. And if the teacher is going to play that kind of role, so not just like empower a student with Dharma teaching, but if they're also going to be that kind of spiritual friend, um, you know, I think it, it does take communities to think about what are what are the uh, what are the back, what are the requirements to be that kind of a teacher to really hold that kind of a space. And I think that's to be that's to be determined. I think that self-authenticating piece is not quite enough. Um, but then again, look, you know, Daniel Ingram self-authenticated, right? He's like the ultimate self-authenticator. Um, some people can't stand him as a teacher, and some people, you know, had their lives changed uh, by him as a teacher. And and I think that's about having, you know, communities around that kind of say, here's what this person's good at, here's here's what they're not good at. Um, so even even maybe that could even work for self-authentication, although I think that takes a little more discernment. Mm, okay, great. So belp, uh, dot com coming soon to uh, the Buddhist the budosphere. <laughs> no, it's a great idea and um, you know I think some of the things we just touched on um, you know have a lot to do with uh, given you know that that certain models aren't going to work moving forward you know what are we going to do to kind of address the uh, the kind of gaps that are happening in wake of those models breaking down and so I really appreciate you know you're offering some some great suggestions there and I think um, you know, it, it's cool to me that we can look to other fields to see how it's being done, and sort of, uh, like you said, bring bring our life into our practice, bring the wisdom and knowledge of other kind of other areas into this sort of broader kind of exploration of um, you know hardcore dharma or the you know the sort of boutique contemplative life. You know, that's only going to kind of be interesting to a small number of people, as you said. Um, so yeah, thank you. It's great to have you on the show, and um, I'm I'm glad that the voting up process worked for you. And uh, uh, thanks everyone for for tuning in and for um, for asking some awesome questions. Thank you. That was cool. All right. Take care, everybody. <laughs>